The Battle of the Bulge is well known. But there's more to the off-treaded tale than the 101st Airborne at Bastogne or Sept Dietrich's drive to Stomont. This is the story of the Battle of St. Fifth. Like Bastogne, St. Fifth was an intersection of six roads. It was also the site of the only rail line in the area running from Belgium to Germany. Today, this is a place we'd call Key Terrain. Whatever the Germans called it in 1944, the commander of the 5th Panzer Army, Hasso Eckhard Baron von Montufel, had declared, the success of the 5th Panzer Army will rest on the early capture of St. Fifth. He ordered General Walter Luft to seize St. Fifth by the end of day one. He would have accepted day two. In a way, St. Fifth was even more important than Bastogne because the Germans lacked gasoline and supplies to move further west. On the other hand, if they took St. Fifth, they could resupply there. The Americans were told to hold St. Fifth at all costs. In residence in St. Fifth was Major General Alan Jones, commander of the 106th Division, the Golden Lions. The last of the U.S. Army's infantry divisions stood up for World War II. It had been as well trained as any other, but it found itself heavily raided to provide combat replacements for other units just before leaving the U.S. Oh, I went to the 740th Tank Battalion over in, uh, well, we were, they were in Belgium at the time when I was re went in as a replacement. And uh, there again, I didn't say anything about my age. I kept my mouth shut because I didn't want them to find out about it. On December 11th, the 106th relieved the Veterans 2nd Division in its positions on the Schnee Eiffel, a long ridge of mountains on the German side of the border. On the 106th left flank was the slightly less green 14th Cavalry Group. To the south was the excellent, if a bit battered, 28th Division, the Bloody Bucket. Communications were mainly by telephone line, as terrain wreaked havoc with the radio net. Luft had two Volks Grenadier divisions to attack these three regiments and assorted other odds and ends. Neither were of the sort that the German propaganda newsreels were apt to tout. There was the three-month-old 18th, which included mostly Luftwaffe soldiers that were given rifles and sent at it, and the 62nd Volks Grenadier, or Moonshine Division, which was predominantly made up of 17-year-old Hitler youths. One wonders how von Mantufel expected St. Vith to be captured within 48 hours. Veterans of the Bulge all mentioned the cold, and this was no coincidence. The launching of the attack was timed pursuant to weather reports from U-boats in the Atlantic. A period of poor weather was intended to ground Allied air power and slow the response. Still, some American patrols were sent out into the cold. We, we had a regular, you know, uh, M1 jacket and the fatigues and, and the GI boots, which were not waterproof, I guarantee you. And uh, it was cold. The fresh 106th heard the German preparations. Some reported them up, only to be told that they were hearing sound deception. Some wondered if they weren't simply suffering from new guy jitters. But at 0530, the morning of December 16th, however, those jitters proved justified. A major barrage of artillery rained down along the line, cutting phone wires, and a ground assault followed a half hour later. By midday, it was obvious that a major attack was underway and that the limited available reserves would all be committed. They told us to go to a ordnance depot, which was nearby, and take anything we wanted. That sounds good. But we got there and all the tanks that they had were shot up. Some were missing radio, all of them were missing radio. Some were missing rammer staffs for the main gun. Uh, some were missing parts and things that they really didn't have to have. But anyway, they put one tank together from pieces of others. German forces moved on the northern and southern flanks, beginning to surround the ridge and briefly taking the gateway village of Blyow. They were turfed out by a scratch unit of the 106th, consisting mainly of engineers, artillerymen, cooks, and clerks, who held the town until ordered to withdraw the following morning. That night, communication challenges would result in one of the most fateful calls in U.S. Army history between Jones and the Corps commander, Middleton. I'm worried about some of my people. I know. How are they? 
not well and very lonely. I'm sending up a big friend. Workshop. It should reach you about 7 a.m. tomorrow. Now, about my people. I think I should call them out. Middleton didn't hear this and continued. You know how things are up there better than I do, but don't you think your troops should be withdrawn? Jones didn't hear the second half of Middleton's question and pressed for orders. I want to know how it looks from where you are. Shall I wait? The conversation was cut off at the end, and Middleton was of the understanding that the 422nd and 423rd were to be withdrawn, while Jones believed they were to remain in position. Though Jones may have disagreed with what he thought was Middleton's position, he was new to the combat zone and didn't push the issue with his boss. December 17th at 10.30 a.m., Brigadier General Bruce Clark of the 7th Armored Division arrived at saint Vith with just three men and a jeep. Jones hopes that the units on Schnee Eiffel would be relieved that day or shattered. The morning of December 18th demonstrated to the Americans in saint Vith the magnitude of the problem they were facing. A convoy from the 7th Armored driving through the town of Potu, six miles behind saint Vith, was ambushed and destroyed by a unit of the 1st SS Liebstandart, though the majority of the troops escaped to report the blockage in the American line of communication. 7th Armor Division was not about to let the road to saint Vith be cut, however, and Combat Command A made efforts to retake the town. By this time, I had a shell in the breach and, it, and I, I'd kick him with my, with my right foot. And he and I had a signal, you know, he knew when I kicked him that the gun was ready to fire. So he hit the solenoid with his left foot, the gun fired, the shell comes out, and by this time, I had the second one in there and kicked him. So we, we could fire, I would say, Three, four seconds. Within three, four seconds, every three, four seconds, they fire a shot. And the same thing with the AP. If there was a tank, I'd have at least two or three APs in my lap, just holding it and then and kicking him and he, he fire and kick him, fire. It used to go very fast. I moved very fast, let me tell you something. When you have another tank coming and you see him, and you see his gun coming out, you move very fast. It became obvious that the U.S. could no longer hold the last bridge across the hour at Steinebrücke for members of the two Schnee Eiffel infantry regiments able to escape encirclement. The engineers blew it, and the 424th with 9th Armored started a fighting withdrawal. The last chance of succor for the two Golden Lions regiments on the hills was to break out of encirclement and recapture the bridge at Schaunberg. The morning of December 19th, the American forces prepared to assault the town of Schaunberg, just as German forces prepared to assault the hills. Unfortunately, the Germans got the head start, and American artillery was overrun before the infantry could get going, and the infantry was delayed by a German barrage. Worse, the Germans had taken measures to protect the one bridge they had captured with heavy anti-aircraft defenses around the town. Not having aircraft to shoot at, the German gunners lowered the barrels and aimed them up the hillside at the attacking Americans. Suffice it to say, the attack failed. Surrounded, out of supplies, and unable to break out, the two regiment commanders decided further resistance was futile and that their soldiers should lay down arms, a decision not necessarily agreed to by the soldiers in question. To this day, there is a debate as to whether the 106th could have kept its regiments on the Schnee Eiffel indefinitely had they been supplied by air like the isolated forces in Bastogne. But there was only a finite amount of airliftability. Some 6,500 men were taken prisoner from the 106th that day, with more taken from other fallen outposts later on. One of them was the division commander's son. Still, the efforts to contain and then reduce the Golden Lions' positions on the Schnee Eiffel meant that there was no significant effort to attack saint Vith until December 20th, now three days behind the German schedule. General Jones surrendered command of the defense of St. Vith to Brigadier General Bruce Clark, Combat Command B, 7th Armored. 
The 7th Armored now provided the major fighting force for the defense. Defeated, and with no more than a regiment and some supporting assets left, American forces repositioned into what has become known as the Fortified Goose Egg, consisting of some 22,000 Americans. German forces would assault the Goose Egg from all sides, forcing the Americans to slowly give up ground. Four tanks from the RC Company went down this road, and there was a curve in it. And just as they got to that curve, here's the lead German tank. So they fired and knocked it out. Lucky shot, bounced off the road and, and hit the tank and went through it. So I put that out. Reloaded, but the gun got stuck. The, the, arm, the round got stuck in the gun. So they called up the next tank with hand signals. He came up and the second German tank was coming around the curve and he fired and he hit it and he knocked it out. Same thing happened on the third tank. They knocked that one out. Well, after the third tank went, the German, this is the first SS Panzer Division now, the best German tank unit that they had. It turned around and turned tail. On December 22nd, Field Marshal Montgomery issued the dramatic orders to have the St. Vith troops fall back. You have accomplished your mission, a mission well done. It is time to withdraw with all honor. None of the Americans liked falling back as a concept. And the 101st was cut off, sent to uh, Bastogne, and 82nd came up to the north shoulder where we were. So when the 82nd got there, they had no tanks with them, of course, because they never had tanks. So we joined up with them, and we stayed with them from, the, from uh, well, about the 23rd of December until the 25th of January. The American forces retreat would have a moving engagement with the German forces until finally crossing the Somme River and destroying the bridge behind them. The heroic defenders of St. Vith defeated the German attack just as much as soldiers did in Bastogne. However, the St. Vith defenders were ordered out by a foreign general, whilst the Bastogne defenders instead became isolated. Thus, in the public perception, one was a defeat, the other a victory. The reality is far different, and though overshadowed in the public consciousness by the defenders of Bastogne, the defenders of St. Vith fought just as tenaciously, and their efforts played a great role in defeating the final major German offensive of World War II in Western Europe. To this day, a 7th Armored Division Sherman stands guard facing east on the St. Vith Road at Vilsam their efforts not forgotten.